the thing still says good. Yes. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the theoretical and computational biophysics seminar. Today, I'm very pleased to host uh, Professor Giovanni Pavan from the Polytechnic University in Turin. Actually, he has dual affiliation. We get there. And um, we were lucky that he was actually visiting the United States during this week, and we just captured him to give us a seminar. So uh, by way of introduction, Giovanni uh, received his initial uh, training as a material engineer, uh, his master's degree, and then a PhD in nanotechnology uh, from the famous University of Trieste, Italy. And then he moved to Switzerland, University of Southern Switzerland in Lugano, where he did his postdoc and actually he stayed, he, he stayed there as a tenured researcher and later a senior researcher for a while in that university until I guess things change and Giovanni decided to have the dual affiliation half in Switzerland and half back into his home country in Turin, the Polytechnic University. And that's actually the arrangement that he has currently mostly in Italy, I would presume. Yeah. And Giovanni actually is involved in software development, development of methods, as well as applying methodology, computational techniques to different systems, assemblies that you can see from his talk. And uh, he is very involved in the community on the editorial boards, and he is a uh, next chair of the next Gordon conference in his field. Uh, that is upcoming. He has more than 120 publications. And, uh, and very good journals, actually, I should say, very good peer review journals. And uh, um, as I said, actually, so looking at assemblies, which are very challenging in our business because they are too big for us to simulate at atomistic level, but they have they are brave enough to look at this system. Thank you very much for coming our way, all the way from Chicago or from Turin, and we look forward to your seminar. Please. So thank you very much, Amado, for this uh, nice introduction, and thank you for inviting me here. It's a real uh, pleasure for me to visit you. And uh, as uh, Amado correctly said, let's say that we are a theoretical group, and we are more than uh, biological assemblies or biological systems. Uh, as you will see, we are very interested into... What's that? <laughs> Okay, okay. I don't yeah. know what it says. Okay, uh, don't, don't do something weird. Okay. So basically, we are interested in artificial self-assembling systems. So we're talking about uh, synthetic self-assembling systems. And we are so interested in self-assembling systems because as you will see, self-assembly is uh, one of the typical ways to obtain fancy dynamic uh, properties uh, like those that make natural materials and natural setups so interesting, let's say. And uh, in principle, during this, uh, this presentation, I will tell you a story of how we started to study the self-assembly of these systems. And we ended up uh, into studying complex systems. And uh, we entered pretty much into uh, different fields, like that of uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera, as you will see. So first of all, a very quick introduction to bring you into what we do. Uh, we are interested, as I said, in self-assembling uh, materials because this is how nature makes its materials. And if we look at different examples in nature at so very high resolution, we can realize that these structures are not static, but they're composed of units that are exchanged in a tight communication with the external environment according to well-defined supramolecular equilibria. So uh, a game, an interplay of K on and K off in which the units are exchanged. And in this way, these materials are intrinsically dynamic, adaptive, they can respond in a dynamic way to external stimuli, they can self-heal, and in a word, they possess many smart properties that uh, are impossible for covalent materials, for example. So this motivated in the last decades, I would say, um, huge efforts in the supramolecular chemistry community in the attempt to understand the rules of how to design the self-assembling units to control not only the structure, but also the dynamics and the dynamic properties of these materials. But this being said, let's say that this is a very difficult to be done. 
And even the simplest, as you will see, self-assembling system is intrinsically very complex uh, um, in terms of uh, the internal behavior. So this motivated uh, years ago the, um, the interest in the community in implementing some computational approaches to go where the experiments cannot go no? and to understand basically how the systems, uh, uh, what was the structures of these systems and uh, uh, how they were working. For example, this is a first case that we studied is a so-called DTA supramolecular polymer. The units are rather simple. You have an aromatic core, three amides, onto which you can graft a variety of side chains, depending, and the side chains can be different depending on the solubility that you want to impart to these fibers. In particular, these are water-soluble fibers, and so you can uh, uh, see that there are amphiphilic side chains. The hydrophobic part is necessary to trigger the self-assembly in water, and the PEG part, the polyethylene glycol part, which is solvophilic, is necessary to have fibers and not blobs, for example. Okay, uh, These uh, guys self-assemble directionally via a combination of uh, di directional shape recognition, so stacking between the aromatic cores, and a threefold hydrogen bonding helices that surround the backbone of the fibers, okay? So one of the problems is that these guys, in all the papers before this year, for example, were reported using this ideal simplified scheme. And these simplified schemes were so much used that the community was really believing that this is how the systems were made, no? This, uh, you know, many times you use uh, idealized schemes and you end up believing that your scheme is the correct way, no? The problem is that uh, understanding exactly what you have inside these fibers was uh, rather difficult because this is a cryo TM of these fibers. And as you can observe, uh, they are as thick as a few nanometers maximum, and they are soft materials, so they offer little contrast, and they are so dynamic that you have a to freeze the samples to visualize these fibers. And in this case, of course, the result is that you kill any dynamics of the fibers. No? So you are changing the system to visualize it, which is a typical problem in experimental setups. So we started developing atomistic and coarse grain models in order to understand exactly, uh, to, uh, to get a closer look at these systems. And this is what uh, we try to do essentially in our group. So typically, we start from chemical structures. We integrate different types of computational and theoretical approaches from multi-scale modeling, advanced simulation approaches, what we call in silico experiments, and machine learning, essentially to do the following, to try to relate the features of the monomers to the structure that they form when they self-assemble, to relate supramolecular structure and their features to supramolecular dynamics, that is the characteristic rate at which the monomers can exchange within the structure and in and out the structure, and to relate structure and dynamics to the dynamic properties that make such materials so interesting, like how fast or slow a material can react to a specific stimulus, so let's say. And once we can reach here at submolecular resolution in such a way that we extract the precious information on how to control the properties of the materials, we try to rationalize this data in the attempt to come systematically back and understand how to change the monomers to control the properties, basically. So in the last years, we have been focusing on a variety of supramolecular architectures, from supramolecular fibers, vesicles, micelles, cages, uh, liquid crystal-like structures, uh, super lattices, uh, tubes uh, of different kinds, up to very complicated assemblies, hierarchical assemblies like these uh, uh, supramolecular polycatenanes. Uh, but uh, aside from uh, the, the structure, let's say, and uh, aside from these models, of course, as you can understand from a technical point of view, I will not uh, have the time to enter into the details, let's say, of the technical steps to do this, but uh, I think that uh, most of you know the difficulties of multi-scale modeling and know that in the development of these models uh, goes a lot of efforts and expertise. So it's a very time consuming and resources consuming. So we also took some time to develop software that can allow us to automatically optimize approximated models. And this means that uh, it works like this. This is a case of lipids, for example, which are per se a self-assembled self system. So let's say bio self-assembled systems. So this software is called the Swarm CG. 
and exploits uh, a particle swarm optimization machinery to basically, uh, if you start, uh, uh, it requires only, let's say, experimental and, uh, uh, sorry, only a, a reference uh, all atom behavior, a trajectory, let's say, and a mapping scheme. So you decide the mapping, how much uh, uh, coarse or uh, higher is the resolution, let's say, in the treatment of the model. And the system um, proposes you some guess of the bonded and unbonded parameters and changes that iteratively, uh, minimizing a scoring function that basically measures the discrepancy between the behavior of your model and the set of targets. Typically, uh, nowadays, the software can mix bottom-up and top-down targets, which means that, for example, in the case of lipids, we could give, as a reference, experiment uh, um, atomistic trajectories of uh, robust uh, force fields, and uh, as well as uh, experimental data on RF lipid thickness, rigidity, flexibility. And in such a way, after the iteration, what you obtain, you obtain an optimized and transferable coarse grain force field that can be used for whatever lipid. Okay? Um, so we are using something like this to parameterize and optimize all the coarse grain models that, uh, that we have. But uh, let's say that uh, I will skip that part because aside from the fact that uh, these simulations can provide you some insights on uh, the structure, uh, of these assemblies, what we are mostly interested in is the most challenging part, that is the characterization of the intrinsic dynamics of these uh, assemblies. That is, I repeat, the characteristic rates involved into the exchange of monomers uh, into these assemblies. Why? Because this is a, a, the basis to understand all the interesting dynamic properties, bio-inspired dynamic properties, they make these materials so interesting, like the ability to adapt or to react in response to stimuli, to cell feel, etc. But in order to understand how to control these properties, it is first necessary to understand the molecular factors that control the dynamics of the assembly. And this requires studying the dynamics of these guys at sub-molecular resolution, so at the resolution. So to measure something, I need a scale that has a resolution higher than what I want to measure. Otherwise, I don't have any quantitative measurement. So this is very challenging, as you know, because uh, typically when you do multi-scale modeling, but also experimental characterizations, you are stuck with these uh, uh, space-time relationships that tell you that if you want to look at your material at a very high resolution, typically you are confined to a very static picture of your system. No, This is true in quantum mechanical calculations, all atom, but also experimentally speaking, you do cryo-TM and you have to freeze your sample or you have to immobilize your assembly on a surface, for example. Well, on the other hand, the dynamic properties that we are talking about are, of course, on human um, relevant time scales, but typically when you want to go here, you lose any resolution to understand what molecular process does what. And this gave us, uh, so essentially what everyone would like to do is to move here, always keeping the necessary resolution that, uh, that is required to understand what does what. But this brings you, this is tricky because it brings you to the rare events regime. You know? So typically, uh, if I want to study the exchange of a monomer out of a fiber, and this occurs every second, if I use an atomistic model where I'm confined to nanoseconds, I should run billions of simulations to observe the event only once. And so this makes it impossible to obtain any statistical um, uh, insight. But this gave us an idea a few years ago to adapt the techniques typical of rare events to study um, the, the, what is de facto a supramolecular reaction, no? so the separation of one monomer from the assembly to the environment. And this is the first one of the first cases that we study is a rather simple supramolecular fiber, where you have the monomers here and they are known to exchange experimentally all along their length. So we use the metadynamics to activate the exchange of a monomer from state A within the fiber to state B outside the fiber, okay? And uh, I, 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 I make the long story short, so I oversimplify a bit, but let's say that what the metadynamic does, metadynamics does is that typically if you want to explore the transition between A to B, 
in real systems, there is such a high free energy barrier that if you use a classical simulation approaches, you will never be able in accessible uh, timescales to visit this. The, the fiber will just vibrate and you will not see any, any exchange. So what MetaDynamic does, if it's set up in an opportune way, you provide energy along to a critical degree of freedom, uh, and uh, this allows you to cross the barrier and to visit the transition. And if this is uh, done properly, depending on how much energy you have to give to accelerate the transition and how long does it take in this accelerated regime, you can recalculate a posteriori the time scales for the transitions that are expected in an unbiased native uh, systems. So uh, this is one of the last cases uh, where, that we studied in this way. These are Rotax chains, uh, molecules that brought uh, to your neighbor uh, in uh, Northwestern, uh, Fraser Stoddard, the Nobel Prize in uh, 2016. And typically, these molecules are interlocked molecules that are very uh, interesting because they dissipate energy in a very cool and intriguing way. And they are intrinsically dynamic. You know, they have a, a, an intrinsic dynamics. So, um, despite this, it's very difficult to understand exactly how do they work because their dynamics is very fast, you know, um, and they are very tiny. So experimental is very difficult. So these are two different families. And Luigi, a PhD student, and now is a postdoc in my group, uh, used metadynamics to study these, uh, these systems. And with metadynamics, you can recalculate the free energy profile for the shuttling motion. And if metadynamics converges well, and this is the case in these systems, um, you can also decompose enthalpy and entropy along the shuttling mechanism, which is very precious because it, it allows you to extract the information on how to control then the kinetics. In this case, for example, if you change the solvent and you use acetonitrile, for example, acetonitrile can create, as you can observe here, you have two stations that are stabilized by hydrogen bonds. Okay, So if you use a, a neutral um, a neutral solvent, you have a very high barrier. And the crossing is in the tens of uh, higher than tens of seconds. In acetonitrile, this is reduces to tens of seconds because of the competitive action by uh, the solvents, which also propose the point that these systems are always more complicated than what you think. So if you study a system like this with an implicit solvent, you won't be able to capture this because these are local effects. And solvent and solute compose a unique complex system, let's say. Um, so this is another case that it's exactly the same, the water soluble supramolecular fiber that uh, I've shown you earlier. As I told you, these are very complicated fibers. This was a model that uh, uh, based on the Martini uh, type resolution, let's say. So the resolution here is roughly five angstroms. And this model was also quite cool because uh, um, one of the tricky part when you course grain these systems is that you lose uh, uh, the ability to describe correctly directional interactions. And so these guys are strongly controlled by hydrogen bonds. So what we did was to create a multi-resolution in the model. Here you have rigidly rotating dipoles. And the dipoles, the partial charges, have been optimized in order to reproduce the same monomer-monomer dimerization free energies seen in metadynamics at atomistic level. Okay, So basically, when we studied this, it was pretty clear that these fibers are far from being perfect, or might be far from being perfect. Very different from the ideal cartoons that I've shown you earlier. And this is the demonstration. This is in this fiber, for example, you can see that this is a, the, the backbone. Here, these are the cores of the monomers. It's not straight at all, no? You have all these branches. And in red, you have monomers that are attached only by one side. So they constitute defects in a sense in the assemblies in the sense that they are spots where the monomers can exchange faster because they are less tightly incorporated and more exposed to the solvent. And in fact, this is what you observe in metadynamics. Now, if we use metadynamics to activate the exchange of one monomer from in within the fiber to the outside, here you see all the defects, let's say in green, this is what you observe. The system starts to absorb energy first the creation of new defect is necessary. But then the monomers do not diffuse in a single step away in solution. Look at this. It starts to slide on the surface of the fiber, moving from defect to defect. 
let's say, until when you what is the reaction coordinate for this? Uh, this uh, is a combination of reaction coordinate. It's the minimum distance core to the closest one, and also the number of contacts of uh, the whole monomer with the rest let's say so one capture an equivalent of the sasa basically right. and another one the specific interaction no? so um basically from this simulation i'm approximating a bit but there is uh, the details are in the paper if you are interested or uh, you can ask me later but we could uh, extract very general insights so first uh, from these approaches you can reconstruct the thermodynamics and kinetics of the exchange events let's say that occur in the system provided that you can set up the simulations and then not always this is uh, simple, I would say. But the general thing that was unknown at that point is, uh, was that uh, dynamics needs defects. I think that most of you know this, uh, this game, no? this, uh, this toy, you start from a disordered array of numbers and you can sort them up. And it's important to understand that you can do that only because there is a defect. No defect, no dynamics, no? If you, and in fact, the movement of defects provokes an opposite movement of the system, no? Mm -hmm. uh, it's like in charge transport, also in materials, etc., holes, electrons, etc. Um, and at such a high resolution, we can extract information on the determinants that control defects, dynamics, and properties in cascade. The problem was philosophical at that point. So it's a bit frustrating in this uh, presentation. As you will see, every time that we obtain a good result, it, uh, it uh, proposes more questions <laughs> than uh, the uh -huh. Any question? No. OK, okay. so um, at that point, there was a philosophical problem, no? How can we? unambiguously and in general way identify defects in the perspective of having fibers that can communicate with the membranes that can communicate with nanoparticles or whatever um, if the defects are at the basis of dynamics we need uh, a general way to identify defects in whatever system no uh, methods that uh, do not require prior knowledge of the of a system that we don't know no and so very uh, soon we turn it to uh, machine learning and abstract uh, descriptors. Um, for example, these are, uh, we, we obtain very good results in the beginning with this uh, high dimensional uh, descriptor, the so-called smooth overlap of atomic position, the SOAP descriptors, which are basically an order parameter that if you place yourself in the center of a monomer within a cutoff sphere, uh, provides you a, a spectrum, a high dimensional spectrum, that is the decomposition in um, spherical harmonics of the order in the displacement of the neighbor cores that are inside the sphere. Okay, pretty. It's very similar to the concept of orbitals, let's say, but on a supramolecular level. Here we are not looking at the localization of electrons, but of other monomers. Okay, so basically you obtain this spectra for every monomer at every time step of the simulation. You obtain a high dimensional data set of soap spectra, and then you have to do dimensionality reduction, and then you have to do data clustering to recognize the motifs, order and disorder motifs that populate your system. And for example, you can see this is exactly the same fiber that you have seen earlier, the one with defects. A method like this colors the atoms based on the soap environments that characterize them. And you can observe that you have defects in pink, the interior of the fiber in blue, and also it detects the sliding monomers in yellow. Those are the monomers that are sliding on the surface, moving from one defect to another one. So this is general, because this is the fiber in water. We can do the same in a different solvent for a different fiber. The unique problem at that point was that this is a data-driven analysis. So uh, this metric knows only the data that you gave to the analysis. So what does it mean? That these colors are not comparable to these colors. This is not a general metric at that point. It's a system-based metric. So you can compare the different environments, but not those environments with these ones. And this gave us an idea of how to solve this in this paper. We created a huge data set, basically, 
containing the spectra of all the cores of all the fibers that you want to compare one to the other. And then you project the data of the individual systems on this global data set. And you can observe that, for example, this fiber that was colored here, in comparison to this one, in reality, is completely ordered. And so all the colors disappear. They are composed only by one environment, that is the ordered environment. Well, here you see a lot of colors. This is a toy model. We like a lot to play with models in a toy way. It's exactly this fiber where we artificially weakened the directional interactions at the hydrogen bonding. So we decreased the partial charges, let's say. And you start observing the creation of local defects along the fiber. This is very useful because you can use models to explore the parameter space and understand what does what in these assemblies. No, So this analysis gives you a, a hierarchical dendrogram that uh, relates all the micro states, monomeric macro states in the fiber uh, in terms of their similarity so that you can use it to build a coarse grain version of, of your analysis. You can see you group these two in purple and you obtain the interior of the fiber, these two in green, and you obtain defects. These must remain separated and these are the fluctuating monomers. This is exactly pretty much similar to the analysis that we expected to find basically, okay? And since we know every monomer to what cluster it belongs at time one and where it goes at time two, we can create these huge transition probability matrices that tell you that in delta t, that is your sampling resolution, what is the probability that a monomer that comes from the purple creates a defect? Once it's a defect, what is the probability to remain there or to be repaired in the interior or to generate a fluctuating monomer that then slides and is reincorporated, let's say, okay? So uh, basically, with this analysis, you obtain two important results. First, you know a lot of things about your system because uh, this is one of the most complete structural and dynamical characterization of an assembly that you could find at that time. So you know all the states, the relative free energy, and also the transition rates between them. And, uh, and this is technical, let's say, uh, this is scientific. But also technically, you obtain an important information. Suppose that you want to coarse grain even more your model of the fiber. These analysis tell you that you have to do it in such a way that these two microstates collapse in one, these two collapse in one, and this one must remain separated because if you coarse grain even more and the red fuses with this, then your model is not more representative of the physics of the original system. So you can use this to understand, to push the coarse graining up to the limit and use the minimum resolution that is necessary to respect the physics of the system. So uh, here I will skip a bit uh, due to time restrictions, but I can tell you that these analyses are so general that for very strange reasons, recently we started also to study metals and the dynamics of metals and, you, and we found very interesting things. So, uh, now we can simulate thousands of metal atoms for hundreds of nanoseconds, thanks to uh, these new approaches based on the training of machine learning force fields. Basically, you run DFT calculations um, of atomic configurations, mm -hmm. and you feed iteratively a machine learning potential. This uh, this is uh, uh, done with the DeepMD. Um, and this allows you to scale up, basically, okay, and to simulate large uh, systems. Metals are interesting. This is copper, where the melting temperature is uh, just below 100, uh, 1,400 Kelvin, let's say. At one-third of the melting temperature, it is known experimentally that metal surfaces can have a weird dynamic behavior. It's known that they can reconstruct environments that should not be there. But obtaining a clear characterization of why and what happens is very difficult, of course, as you can understand. From a computational point of view, because you are limited in the timescales and experimentally because of the resolution, of course. But uh, for example, we simulate different surfaces and this is the crystalline surface, what, namely what you would expect to have in the system. But if you simulate them at 700K, 
which is a one half of the melting temperature, more or less, this is what you observe. Not only they have dynamics, because this is colored based on the coordination, so the surface is changing, but it's changing in a non-uniform way. There are surfaces that are more static and surfaces that are way more dynamic. Okay, and so when we saw all these colors that you can see here, this is a two one zero that is the most dynamic uh, of the of these surfaces, widely used in heterogeneous catalysis of CO two, for example, where these motifs are very important, you no, know, because they are the reactive sites. Okay, but if you simulate, this is what you observe <laughs> in one hundred and fifty nanoseconds. And if you zoom, as you can observe something, there is a lot of action here, no? And if you zoom, you can observe fancy things, like here there is a square domain proper of a 100 surface that should not be there. Here you can see clearly a 110 terrace that should not be here. So the problem is that when we see this changing, <coughs> the uh, what, what's happening into this surface? To what extent the 210 surface remains itself when you turn temperature on? So we use the, um, the soap analysis to do that, to, to, to shed light on that. And in particular, we combine a bottom-up to a top-down classification uh, using soap spectra. In particular, for every ideal surface, we detect the soap spectra of the different atomic species that compose those crystalline surfaces. As you can observe, there are richer one and poorer one, let's say simpler one. And, uh, and then we create a similarity dictionary of environments. And then calculating the distance between the soap spectra of every atom that is visited along the MD in terms of similarity with the ones that are uh, included into the dictionary, we can color our surface. The result is this, like this is a 211 surface. Uh, the colors here are specific of the different uh, theoretical uh, surfaces. So every time that you see green, these are native uh, motifs. This is what you observe, let's say. As you can observe, there are many different colors that appear here, which means that locally the environment is closer to that of a 111 or a 110. Okay, we can monitor exactly uh, how, to what extent, the surface preserves its identity and the type of environments that it reconstructs, also at the very microscopic level, and how persistent they are. So they are there are domains like this 11. Uh, uh, one on one terraces that are very persistent. Uh, their, pers their lifetime uh, is, uh, is considerable at, uh, at that uh, resolution. And other liquid like domains that are more liquid, let's say. And so these are other surfaces. We can do the same. This is a very unstable surface, and this converts to a, one -on -one, to a two on one surface in part. You can see the, the edges of the waves that should not be there. And um, and basically, this allowed us to propose this criterion of statistical identity of a metal surface that is function of the conditions in which they, they, they are, okay? And, uh, and this is important to understand the reactive mechanical properties of these uh, materials and so on. So we, we did the same also for uh, gold nanoparticles. This is the dynamic of an icosahedral gold nanoparticle already at room temperature, because the smaller is the system, the huger is the surface over the, the bulk behavior, and so they become very, very dynamic. So in general, with all this machinery, you can compare, coming back to our soft matter scheme, you can classify assemblies based on their similarity. Similarity in what? in the local structural and dynamical environment that surrounds every monomer in the system, which is the key basically to understand the dynamics. And for example, this is the huge work that Andrea Gardin, who just left the group with the, um, after the PhD, uh, did in our group. Uh, it's a huge study that uh, classifies different types of fibers, ordered and disordered, uh, flat assemblies to the assemblies like lipid bilayers at different temperatures, micelles, uh, uh, nanoparticles, so 3D assemblies. As you can observe, the result might seem trivial, like you see, wh when you see dark colors, it means a similarity, okay? And you see three macro families, 
1D assemblies, 2D assemblies, 3D assemblies, apart from some anomalies. Like this is exactly the BTAW is the disordered fiber that I have shown you earlier, the one with defects. As you can observe, this is more similar in the structural dynamics of the monomers to 2D assemblies rather than to the other fibers. And in fact, a posteriori, if you look at that fiber from along the axis, this looks like a worm-like micelle, and that's why it has a dynamic surface. So this is important because if we want to create a system where these guys communicate with each other, we must have a communication that's, of course, on comparable time scales for both. Otherwise, one, we have the receiver, but we don't have the message or vice versa, you know. So um, basically, the idea is to use this metric to uh, classify the assemblies based on their similarity, order, disorder, and dynamics, and then to do the same on the features of the monomers and come systematically back and create a relationship useful for rational design. But we are still in the process of this, so it's still going on. So uh, in principle, what we want to obtain are structure dynamics property relationships useful for rational design. So like, for example, we studied fibers that can reconfigure dynamically and back depending on, on the stimuli, um, reactive systems where you have reactants that absorb in cages, the reaction occurs and then they are expelled and you can speed up the reaction depending on the affinity between host and guest, very similar to what enzymes do, for example. Or this uh, that, uh, that you just saw, it's a, it's a very fancy case, and it's a polymeric nanoparticle decorated with the groups. And on the surface, we have the complementary groups. And we demonstrate that if you have multivalent interactions, there is a, a level where the nanoparticle cannot escape and disassembles, exfoliates, and release the entrapped guest. And this is very interesting imagine the applications from drug delivery, et cetera. No? And uh, we are using this machinery to understand how to rationally design the monomers to, to control the density at which we want the nanoparticle to disassemble, let's say. And imagine the treatment of tissues where you overexpress receptors, uh, et cetera. Um, but until now, I mean, this is the simplest part because until now, whatever I have shown to you require, uh, concerns the behavior of individual assembled objects. But real self-assembly systems are more complex than that. Typically, if you take thousands of monomers and you let them self-assemble, you don't come out with one fiber and you don't even come out with uh, 100 identical fibers. Uh, we are not in the world, unfortunately, of proteins, you know? Mm -hmm. You have distributions. And in particular, even if you start from the simplest possible self-assembling uh, motif, like a discotic unit, imagine an hexagon, where the hexagons interact with each other via Leonard-Jones interaction, just by the central bits. The side bits are just screening bits. Uh, they are there because we want the formation of fibers and not of nanoparticles, for example. But uh, if you put 2,000 of monomers here, what you observe is this. You start seeing the creation of longer fibers. They become red, but then the red fade off and disappears. And then it comes back again, and then it disappears. Of course, uh, here the subject cannot be a supramolecular fiber. It's the ensemble of supramolecular fibers. There are multiple entities that continuously communicate with each other. And uh, when the system will react, we react as a whole. And the problem is understanding how it will react, you know? So this brought us into the field of complex systems, even at the, at the level of complex molecular systems. So the subject is not more one assembly, but it's at that point, all the monomers in the system, where they are, where do they go, how long they live, et cetera. And we are interested, as I, uh, I will speak in the next slides about dominant fluctuations, emergent collective properties, et cetera. So basically network behaviors, okay? So in a simulation like this, we know all the populations of uh, entities that populate the system over time, independently of whether we, st we start from um, 100 identical stacked fibers or disassembled monomers, as you can observe, after some time, we reach exactly the very same microscopic equilibrium. 
system, no? which means that the number and the type of entities does not change anymore over time. But if you look at this, this is a very funny parameter uh, that we borrowed from the complex system field is a traffic parameter that is the sum of all the binding and unbinding events that occur over time. As you can observe, it keeps growing, which means that this microscopic equilibrium is a dynamic equilibrium. Uh, every time that the monomer leaves, another one arrives. And so the size remains preserved, okay? And basically this brings us to an enormous data set of information that is a, for every monomer we store at every time step to what assembly it belongs and to which assembly is going at the next time step. And this is a, the raw data. Here we coarse grain in an opportune way this matrix uh, using a logarithmic uh, coarse graining because we want to keep the zoom in the smaller units that are very crucial. And um, as you can observe, the results were very interesting since the beginning because uh, on the diagonal of this uh, transition probability matrix, you have the probability that a monomer that belongs to this assembly remains there in delta T or goes into something else, okay? As you can observe, the numbers increase and then they start decreasing again. And this, uh, the maximum fits very well with the average size that you have in the system, clearly. No, so it's a probabilistic view of what you are observing uh, in the assembly in the system. And another point, as you can observe, the numbers on the right are higher than the numbers on the left. This is polymerization, and this is the the probability of depolymerization. Before this critical size, the probability of polymerizing is higher than that of depolymerizing. So these small sizes are out of equilibrium, let's say. And the bigger ones, the opposite, you see the transition, no? Here, the opposite starts to appear, okay? So larger fibers have a higher probability to break and disassemble rather than to. And so we can use this matrix and create a phase diagram of all the communication events that occur in the system. Like, for example, if you take these parts, these are events that uh, uh, pertain to large assemblies, and in particular, the breakage, fragmentation, and recombination of fibers, fusing and breakage, etc. While this part is uh, events that occur and uh, pertain to smaller units, like exchange of one monomer that goes to another fiber and another one comes in, okay? And so basically we can, for uh, this is the most probable size in the system, we know all the equilibrium with all the other entities and averaging, we can understand to what percentage this fiber whispers to the other small units or scream to the others uh, breaking in large, uh, uh, in large fragments, okay? Why this is interesting? I show you why. Very tiny differences at the monomer level in these systems create an enormous difference in the ensemble behavior. This is the demonstration. This is a very simple supramolecular polymer compatible with, with the real fiber in organic solvent. At high temperature, the sum of these first three columns is higher than the blue one. The blue one is fragmentation and recombination. These three are the exchange of smaller units. So at high temperature, the assemblies exchange and communicate by exchanging smaller units like monomers, dimers. If you decrease the temperature, the opposite occurs, but you can see that there is a striking difference, okay? Pretty obvious, but what does it change if I change something in the structure of the monomer? If I take these bits of the monomer and I make them slightly more solvophobic, they start hating a bit. So the solvent is less good. I still have fibers, but this is how they communicate. At the same temperature, I am completely reverting how the entities communicate in the system. And of course, this will change how this network of fibers reacts when it's perturbed compared to this, of course, okay? So uh, basically, the idea is that we are interested in using these approaches to study the microscopic dynamics of complex assembly systems and the properties that emerge within them and how they emerge. So we are studying these systems as complex systems. So as you know, 
Uh, in complex systems, uh, basically, there are many interacting units, uh, and the behavior that uh, the behaviors and properties that you see in the complex systems exceed those typical of the units. But one terrific question is at that point: how much complexity do we need? to have uh, complex behaviors. Like in real macroscopic systems like bird flocks, not only we have a, a high number of uh, units, but the units are also diverse because there is no way that there are two identical birds, okay? They are different and also us as humans, we are different. And at the molecular level, what does it happen? We don't have diversity necessarily, so we can isolate the two factors. So I can tell you that you can see complex behaviors already when the complexity is very tiny in your system. And I'll show you an example. So we could work on this very nice supramolecular system recently. These are supramolecular lattices uh, composed of golden nanoparticles that are covered by uh, polymeric pendants that terminate with a charge, okay? So the nanoparticles are positively charged and they self-assemble into hexagonal FCC lattices, sorry, into FCC lattices in the presence of oppositely charged citrate ions, okay? But we demonstrate in this paper that the ions, even after they glue together the nanoparticles, they are not static. They can exchange within the lattice. Uh, so there is an equilibrium dynamics. So you can see that this is a SOAP analysis that detects different environments, ions at the interface, ions that are attached only by one side to the surface, et cetera, and they communicate with each other. This is interesting because uh, uh, many nice works uh, were published recently on the possibility to replicate the properties of electronic materials on a higher scale like in a supramolecular scale, the groups of uh, Chad Mirkin, Monica Vera de la Cruz, Sharon Glotzer reported very nice uh, papers uh, on uh, um, nanoparticles that behave like nuclei of atoms uh, that are bind together by electron equivalents, uh, let's say. So they propose the concept of uh, metallicity of supramolecular assemblies. But we wondered, I mean, is it really metallicity or is something different? You know, because, you know, in metals, it's not just enough that things move. They must move in a precise way uh, to be metals. You know? So what Chiara did in our group was to challenge a system like this, creating the typical system to, to probe the metallicity. So we created a, an infinite lattice and we performed a homic experiment. So we put an electric field and we measure the movement of the ions along the electric field. And we observed immediately a weird behavior, not a metallic one. First of all, the behavior is not homic. You don't have a line here. You see no conduction up to a minimum level. And after this, you start having a homic uh, behavior. This is not typical of metals. This is typical of another class of materials, semiconductors, where you have to cross a band gap to activate the conduction. Another uh, thing that is different, you increase the temperature, you increase the conductivity. In metals, typically the opposite of course, no? you want to go down in temperature because they dissipate with, uh, with temperature, okay? So how this uh, supramolecular semiconductivity comes from? So if you take your lactis, you know that an FCC lactis has the nodes, and also have the cavities, you know? There are cavities that these are octahedral cavities. So if you replicate the box, this is in the middle of an octahedron and tetrahedral cavities, okay? So if you do a soap analysis of the ionic environment within, so basically we are measuring the soap spectra of the ions with respect to each other. So only looking at the structural and dynamical behaviors of the ions in the system, the, 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 soft, the analysis recognizes three different environments, interface ions, ions in the tetrahedral and in the octahedral cavity. And if you calculate the transition probability matrix, you can see that you have some dynamics in the system because you have no zero out of diagonal numbers. But as you can observe, there is no direct communication between the ions that are in the red cavity and in the cyan cavity. And you increase the electric field, still no communication. After you reach this threshold, look at how it happens in the system. 
This is the threshold at which the ohmic conductivity starts, and it correlates very well with the opening of conductive gates that connect the two cavities. So basically, you are creating holes, and the ion starts to diffuse in these holes in the cavities. And as you can observe, you reach an equilibrium where basically the unique persistent environment, that is the environment that at this resolution has a probability number higher than 50%. This means that the probability of an ion to remain there is higher than to undergo transition, is the blue one. This is a phenomenon very similar to the conductivity in metals. You know? In metals, the electrons should be everywhere. But when you conduct them, not all the electrons clearly can, can uh, transport the uh, electric current. Otherwise, the crystal would melt. You know? And there is a, a, an asymmetry that generates into the system where they localize at the interface, they keep the nuclei together, and the other ones um, conduct. The point is that, of course, to understand the origin of these, you need a microscopic description of dynamics. You cannot average. If you average the diffusivity, you don't understand anything about that. Okay? So basically, I skip these. We are studying a variety of systems. The idea is that once we have an equilibrium, uh, we perturb the equilibrium, and we want to understand the origin of the, the change and the adaptation of the system. But this brought us into the necessity to develop new descriptors because order parameters do not work in such environment. The noise and the complexity is so huge that the noise is higher than the fluctuations. So we created a new descriptors. The first one that I show you was published earlier in, uh, last year, uh, developed by Martina in our group is the so-called LENS, Local Environments and Neighbors Shuffling. It's a very simple descriptor. You place yourself in every unit in your system. It may be an atom, it may be a molecule, it may be a person, if you have a trajectory. And within a cutoff, you keep track of the ID of the neighbors. It's not a coordination number. It's a list of identities. And as a simulator, so we are advantaged in that because we have trajectories, even if we have all identical uh, water mo molecules. But in reality, in our trajectory, we know that this is water number one, this is water number two, etc. So we are exploiting this. Uh, we have a string with the names of the neighbors. And in delta t, we monitor how much the string changes. And it can change if you have a permutation or if you add a neighbor, or if you lose a neighbor. Basically, if you measure the extent of the change in delta t, is the speed of change in the neighborhood, OK? And if you have a fluid-like system, typically you obtain spectra like this. If you have a solid-like discrete dynamics, you have a very, these very sharp jumps like this. So this is very, very general. It can be applied to whatever. You just need a trajectory of the IDs in your system. And for example, it works very well. This is a lipid bilayer of DPPC lipids that at this temperature is very close to the gel to fluid transition. And it's able to detect the early nucleation of um, liquid phase in the gel very close to the transition. Uh, uh, to the transition. And of course, it, uh, it can recompute the transition by looking at the dynamics, so simply how fast or slow the units move. Or it works, so this is a fluid system, but it works also in discrete dynamics. This is a metal surface that is very fun funny, because if you use an order parameter, it looks like a completely immobile. But these are the lens spectra, and you can observe that despite the fact that 99.9% .9 of atoms are immobile, a small fraction jumps like hell along the dynamics. And this is what the descriptor show us. This is the surface seen from the top. This type of behaviors, we were completely overlooking it earlier, because these are five atoms over 5,000. And there is no way that the pattern recognition approach can recognize that. But as you can understand, the reactivity of these atoms, for example, is super higher than the rest. So it's very important to not to lose this information. No? And uh, basically, well, uh, I, I, I skip the details of this, but if you merge SOAP and lens analysis, you can create 
um, a better comprehension of your system. Uh, you can understand that here, a SOAP analysis detects is full of structural information, but does not have any information about local dynamicity. Like you can observe here, you have a red fluctuating atom that here is classified as a part of a edge. So here there is an error, okay? And here you don't have any structural information. So the idea of this new work of Martina was this. If I can create a new data set where I have all the soap spectra and the change that is related to every local structural environment, then I can create, you can see that this is the PCA of the soap spectra. This is the soap plus length data set. And it decouples part of the points that are transferred here. And these are classified now as a different environment. And that these are exactly the length domains, the, the fluctuating domains. And in this way, you can create microscopic structure dynamics relationships. Why? Because you know that this fluctuation is generated from the edge with the probability of 0.1% of, uh, sorry, um, yeah, 0.1%, uh, let's say, at this resolution. They leave this time and then they are repaired. And uh, this is generally, you can do it for whatever system. So not only this improves the analysis, but it also allows you to create, to understand in your system, the formation of what domains create what dynamic behavior, let's say, no? So we create other descriptors. This is time soap, which, uh, um, different from lens measures the speed of the structural change in the neighbors. So this is a permutationally invariant. So if there is a permutation, it doesn't give any information, but it tells you different from lens. It gives you an information in a, if they reconstruct, let's say locally, you know? So basically, um, basically, as you, as you can understand, this is brought us from pattern recognition analysis to time series analysis. And here there is a clear technical problem. When a fluctuation becomes relevant and stems out from the noise, we need robust ways to distinguish fluctuations from noise and abstract ways to detect fluctuations. And in particular, most uh, clustering algorithms uh, fail in this because uh, these fluctuations are sparse, local, and even, even if dominant, they are difficult to catch. Okay, so we developed this new algorithm uh, that is called onion clustering to do that. It's a very nice algorithm. I, I, I mean, I'm biased on that, so but you can give me your opinion. So imagine this is a very simple system, ice and water, 50-50. Okay, and these are the lens spectra of all the molecules. You can already see that you have dense systems, the dense parts at low dynamicity regime and a high dynamicity regime. So this is ice and this is water. And this, but also here you have a lot of action, no? So typically, if you run any unsupervised clustering approach on this data set, it recognizes only ice and water, and that's it, okay? Onion clustering, and typically the problem is that the hugest is the population of these, the more difficult is the discretization of these. Mm -hmm. Okay? So what the software does is this. <clears throat> Pretty much like peeling an onion, where you see the external evident layer, you classify it, you detach it, and you uncover the internal ones. The software detects a first dynamic environment that is the hugest the, most, the, the most populated one. <laughs> and it starts from the assumption, it's a dynamic environment. So we have a, an average dynamicity and a standard deviation. So I can fit a Gaussian over it. I fit a Gaussian and I count in Delta T, which is the time resolution in the study of my time series, all the molecules that remain there for Delta T. So those are the molecules that belong to environment one. Once I have classified that, and this is the hugest novelty, I take them out from the time series. So I delete the data because they are already classified. And deleting the data, I'm deleting their noise. And this uh, creates an adaptive metric. This is the time series, what remains of the time series. Now it's clear that you don't have only one minimum here. You have another one, and this was, was a hidden, okay? You find another one. This is a, and I will show what it is. 
Again, you classify, you the task. You find the third one, you classify, you the task. There is a, a fourth one, you classify, you the task. And the system is self-conclusive because there is a moment when the remaining information, that the residual information, either do not fit the Gaussian or they never stay inside the Gaussian for delta t. So these are the transitions that cannot be classified at your resolution because they are faster. So what is different in this? Typical clustering algorithm divides all the data into clusters. This is not what this uh, does. This divides the information in the information that can be classified in a statistically robust way. And the part that is undetermined, I take it out of the indetermined and I classify only the safe one. And in this way, I have a robust way from the intersection of the Gaussians. I have the limits of the clusters. I can color my time series. And I see that in, at this resolution, I can distinguish in a robust statistical way, the bulk, the interface, the liquid, et cetera, in my system. And you might tell me, yeah, but this depends on the resolution, no? So you must know your system to choose the right one. That's why to avoid that the software is used as it is typical by unsupervised clustering approaches as a black box, we have onion clustering repeats the analysis at all possible resolutions from the a single time step to the entire time series. And what it outputs is a plot like this. This tells you how many clusters can be classified as a function of the resolution, temporal resolution in the study of your analysis. And you can understand that if you study your system with a accuracy lower than 10 nanoseconds, you can see that in, in blue you have the clusters and they decrease sharply. And in orange, you have the population of the M0, which is the cluster that contains the unclassified information. You can understand that after 10 nanoseconds, you have a huge loss of information. And in fact, the system learns only two environments, ice and whatever is not ice, because it's changing faster, which is the liquid. Let's say that's why every system, every approach done on the entire time series give you water and ice. But this then allow you to have to make an informed choice on the time resolution at which is better to study your system. Depends on depending on the event that you want to do and um, at different resolutions. You can reconstruct the internal dynamics. Uh, the beauty is that it works in trajectories at the equilibrium. In trajectories uh, out of equilibrium, this is a freezing water, and you know that analyzing systems like this is very tricky because the result depends on the length of the simulation. No? If I prolong the simulation, ice becomes a predominant and I lose information that the water even existed in my system, okay? Not with onion clustering, because if your resolution is high enough, so higher than the existence of water, it detects all these environments and it colors, it tells you how many environments populated the system over time and you can observe up to when you have to stay below this because otherwise you are losing too much information. So it works also for out of equilibrium trajectories. It works for trajectories dominated by rare events. This is exactly the same metal that you have seen earlier where we see the sliding and we have exactly the same behavior. And it works for every system and not necessarily molecular and not necessarily from simulations. For example, this is an experimental trajectory of uh, the so-called Quincy rollers, which are microscopic polymeric nanoparticles uh, reported in this very nice paper in PNES. Um, they are polystyrene nanoparticles, so they are per se not completely identical. There is a size distribution and they have a residual dielectric into them in such a way that when they are confined into a layer, if you put a constant electric field, they behave in a complex dynamic behavior. Uh, and so in this case, for example, you can see a density wave that crosses the system, you know? So with this approach, for example, without knowing anything about your system, this uh, clustering method tells you that if you study your trajectory, uh, here we are using two human-based variables, like the alignment of the velocities, and the minimum distance with the, uh, between the particles. 
onion clustering detects different clusters and you can see that it illuminates your movie it works like a filter you can see the wave that is uh, passing by and this is a very precious tool because uh, if you understand what's happening into your system you can understand the forces mm -hmm. here this is not simulations and um, so the problem in this uh, type of systems is that you don't know the forces that uh, underpin this behavior okay so basically i conclude by saying that uh, we developed uh, more evolved uh, descriptors that are composed in this case by a uh, lens and time soap components and in this case you have a higher dimensional descriptor that catches whatever fluctuation you have in your system and it can understand if it is a, a structural or a dynamical uh, fluctuation uh, and in, in this case this is exactly the same method that you have seen earlier um, these allow us to correlate in space and time the fluctuations and look for causation uh, relationships, which is very interesting to understand how these systems behave. And uh, basically, in phase transitions, we know that basically they are coordinated, so the fluctuations follow the diagonal in this time soap and lens environments. But there are systems where this is not the case, like in metals, when you break the metals, this is a tensile strength simulation experiment. When the dislocation starts moving, you don't have any signal from a structural fluctuation, but just from the lens component. And all the lens uh, fluctuations are coordinated in space and simultaneous in time, of course. And uh, you can, uh, why this is interesting? Because if you come back to the system about which you don't know anything, you can see, for example, that the single descriptors illuminate the wave in a slightly different way. Lens shows you that the uses dynamical fluctuations are really on the very tip of the wave, and the other part is a structural um, uh, reconstruction. And in fact, you can see that the red here, that is the most lens part of the fluctuations, is really at the front of the wave. And this part that is more soap is on the back of the wave. So now we are going further into this to understand, to create these structural dynamics relationships. So I'm sorry that I ran a bit uh, longer in time. This is my group. I would like uh, to thank you very much again for uh, your attention and I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice seminar. I really enjoyed the seminar. I, I wish I had seen some proteins in there. And in fact, <laughs> we have plans to use the uh, onion clustering for protein maybe. Sure. Because, you know, we protect proteins and we want to see how it propagates. For example, a drug bind here to the protein. And on the other side, you see another protein is activated. So we are interested in the allosteric pathway between events in proteins and so on and so forth. So I guess I see a lot of opportunities if we can use your very nice clustering, very interesting to our simulations, actually. Yeah, sure. So how, how come you never looked at proteins? Is uh, messy. <laughs> but I have to be honest with you. So uh, I started my career with proteins, but then I found out that they were so complicated that I, I like more. Uh, I found more convenient to come back to materials. So let's okay. okay. Uh, questions? No more questions. But the, the methods are so general that basically. Yeah. You just need a trajectory. They can be applied to whatever. I cannot guarantee the results sure, because I never sure. tried it, but sure, sure. we can try for sure. Yeah. So how can, we, how can you freeze water in four nanoseconds, by the way? We had a speaker several years ago. They spent three years to freeze water in simulations. <laughs> and they, they got to cover in nature, you know? Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, he played music also. Yeah, from right? Japanese guy, yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. remember. No, but, but this is because it's not starting from room temperature, no? Uh, you remember that uh, I showed uh, a coexistence case where it's, okay. uh, it's zero Celsius, they coexist. I see. Simply from there, we go down in that, oh, okay. and so it, uh, there see. is already ice. No? There's already nucleation. Already it's a pre-nucleation, so... I see, I see, I see. But we wanted just that it's not that important. In that case, we just wanted to show yeah. that even if mm -hmm. you lose one environment over time, mm -hmm. the method is still able to recognize that it existed, mm -hmm. which is very important, no? Because uh, um, when you want to study whatever events, right. if you miss important uh, events that occurred, 
uh, you could overlook uh, important see. information. I, no? see, I see, I see, I see. I also had a question about your, so you had some uh, very cool molecular systems, interlocked systems that yeah. they were moving. Some of them were conjugated or not? Did I see it correctly or not? No, 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 they were, they were simply reimaged in such a way that the axis was horizontal, but basically yeah. uh, they, well, uh, Depends One of them the that yeah, was yeah, very yeah. flexible to yeah. study the unbinding, let's say. Okay. We kept uh, it uh, confined, let's say, at least for the movies, because I otherwise see. it was a bit yeah. bad. Okay. Uh, but, uh, but the real numbers are uh, in the free conditions, so of course. Okay. But most of them have a rigid thread because uh, yeah. they design it such way, you know, okay. like the case with all the rings mm -hmm. is rather rigid. It can just rotate, basically. So our guest has to leave to Chicago, for Chicago immediately yeah. after the seminar. If you have any questions, this is it. We don't have a session with the guest after. Go ahead, Kate. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's it's going in and out for the metal surfaces, uh, the changing between the lattice orientations. Is that natural physical state? Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, there are... Um, so again, uh, in that case, uh, finding a one-on-one -on -one superposition with experimental evidences is not easy. Because, uh, uh, but there are studies also from a few years ago that demonstrate, for example, that if you start from a 210 copper surface or 211, you have peaks in the spectra that are proper of other surfaces, like the ones that I have shown you, that uh, were not expected there. But how long do they live and where do they come from? It was basically impossible to characterize. No, uh, basically, they just have the Boltzmann probability that they appear, but uh, they don't know how, okay? So that's that was the take-home message of that approach, basically. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. Yes. And so in the in the lens descriptor, like uh, in the cutoff, like systems, uh, components. Yeah, of course uh, you have a uh, like every time that you use a descriptor, you you have to pass through a first. Uh, uh, let's say setup phase in which you test different uh, uh, cutoffs. Uh, for example, where you have uh, local events, if you exaggerate too much with the cutoff, you risk that the information in the string, I mean, the, the, the change, the weight of the change reduces, of course. We found that, for example, both in soap, but also in lens, if you want to study fluid dy uh, dynamical systems, it's better, for example, not to stay only with the first shell of neighbors, but also include the second one. Vice versa, if you have sharp events, it's basically better to include only the first one. You have to try a bit. There is no uh, black or white. So you have uh, some type of... Uh, but the lens depends less than so, for example, or less than the coordination number on, uh, on, uh, on the cutoff anyways. Mm -hmm. So the worst thing that can happen is that you lose some information, not that you see black for white, you know, you don't see impossible things, typically. The risk is that you don't see very well things. No? Mm -hmm. So this method of onion plus selling, is this available on your website? Is a, there is a preprint. So okay. if you go, if you go on my website, there yeah. is the link to yeah. the preprint and in the preprint there are all all the links to the GitHub, uh, Zenodo, etc. So you can use it. Perfect. Any question from online people? No, no I'm nothing. Not okay. Okay. So if nothing else, let's thank you. Only one more. Okay.